<clears throat> Thank you. Well, Robbie uh, asked me to speak at the conference this year. He said, what do you want to talk about? I go, I don't care, just make it an easy topic. <laughs> so he gave me Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. No. Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn there if we could. In actuality, this is actually a paper that I did uh, in seminary for my uh, dear professor, J. Dwight Pentecost. And I was uh, taking a doctoral class, but he was only teaching it at the master's level. So I asked him if I could take the class anyway, and he says, yeah, you just have to write a big paper on uh, how Kadesh Barnea opens the door to the solution of Hebrews 6. And I thought he was speaking in tongues when he <laughs> said that. I didn't know what he was talking about, but... I drilled down into this, and I really found that his view on it, uh, I feel, is the best uh, explanation thus far that I've heard. And we're kind of living in this generation of specialists. Robbie just made reference to that, where people say, well, I'm just a New Testament scholar. I don't interact with the Old Testament. Or I'm just an Old Testament scholar. I don't interact with the New Testament. And the last time I checked, this book is called Hebrews, right? New Testament referring to Jewish people in the Old Testament. Uh, my wife likes to quote this when she tells me there's biblical support for the husband making coffee in the morning. She quotes Hebrews. <laughs> she says it says Hebrews, not Shebrews. <laughs> so some of you ladies might need to use that in your ammo. But anyway, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is a big problem until you actually pay attention to what the Old Testament says about this. So let's open our Bibles to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. And here is the troubling passage. It says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So crystal clear, right? Let's just close in prayer and call it a day. Now, but this, this uh, is a terrifying passage uh, when you look at this, particularly with the word impossible, to renew them away unto repentance, have fallen away. Uh, what what does all of this mean? And there are at least um, four different views on it, maybe even perhaps more. And just to kind of uh, tip my hand a little bit, I'm in view number four, which I'll be explaining to you. But I'll backtrack towards the end of this and interact with the three prior views. But go back, if you could, back to Hebrews 3 for just a second. And I won't read the passage, but I think this is the key that really unlocks not just this passage, but the whole book. Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11, particularly there in verse 10, where God says, I was angry with that generation. That is a citation, as you'll recognize, from Psalm 95. When you study Psalm 95, what you'll see that it's talking about is the generation that we call the Kadesh Barnea generation. The generation of Jews that came out of Egypt had received the law, and they got there to the southern border of Egypt, uh, not Egypt, Canaan, and they looked into the land, and what did they see in the land? Giants. And so they fell into fear. And all but two of them, Joshua and Caleb, who were allowed to enter later on with the kids as seasoned citizens in their 80s, uh, the rest of them were basically left to wander around in the wilderness. And that whole story is recorded until they all dropped dead. And then God began to, began to work with the new generation. 
But you'll find that whole story in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. So therefore, at the beginning of the book, the author is drawing a deliberate parallel between that generation and what the audience in the book of Hebrews is on the precipice of doing. So there they were in Goshen, then they went down to Sinai and received the law, about a two-month journey. From there, according to Deuteronomy 1 verse 5, there's an 11-day journey between Horeb or Sinai and Canaan. And God says, all you got to do is trust me for 11 days, and you're in. And we know what happened. They stopped trusting God when they saw the giants in the land and what should have been an 11-day journey to victory turned into a 40-year nightmare. So the author, by quoting Psalm 95, is reminding us of that historical happenstance. So he wants us, the author of Hebrews, and we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews exactly. Some say Paul, but we don't, we don't know that for sure. But the author, whoever he was, is drawing a connection between the Kadesh Barnea generation and what the audience in the book of Hebrews um, is contemplating doing. So the source of fear for the Kadesh Barnea generation is the giants. The source of fear for the Hebrews, I believe, is the unbelieving Jews. When you study the book of Acts, for example, the major troublemakers against the new church is always the unbelieving Jews. Uh, not every time, but most of the time. And so the unbelieving Jews is persecuting the Hebrews in the New Testament and trying to get them to renounce their confession. I think their confession is, is their baptism. It's the word confession you'll find in Hebrews 3 verse 1. To renounce that and drift back into Judaism. The disobedience for the Kadesh Barnea generation is not occupying Canaan. The disobedience for the Hebrews generation is contemplating and actually on the precipice of lapsing back into Judaism, uh, which we call apostasy. In other words, leaving full revelation in Christ and going back to a revelation which was good because God gave it, but it's inferior compared to the revelation they now have in the New Testament. The consequence of the Kadesh Barnea generation of doing this was a loss of Canaan. The consequence for the Hebrews generation of doing this is other kinds of losses that they're going to miss out on, as I'll try to explain. Loss of maturity and then the prospect of divine discipline. Now, when you look at Hebrews 6 and verse 9, it says, For we have better things concerning you. In other words, the Hebrews had not yet crossed the point of no return and retrogressed the way the Kadesh Barnea generation had. So the author is using Kadesh Barnea as a paradigm an example of there's going to be some kind of forfeiture or loss. Just as they experienced a loss, you will experience a loss if you lapse backward. So that's why he is bringing up Psalm 95. And if we understand Psalm 95, we'll understand Numbers 13 and 14. If we understand Numbers 13 and 14, then suddenly these mystery passages, like Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, which probably is the most debated passage, not only in the book of Hebrews, but perhaps in the whole Bible. Suddenly those passages start to make sense when we connect the dots. So the view that I'm going to give is um, what's called the loss of blessings view. And um, I'm going to try to explain that by looking at, number one, the Exodus generation itself. Looking at two things. Number one, their believing status. And number two, their actual loss of Canaan. And then from there, we'll move into the New Testament and look at Hebrews, and we'll look at the exact same thing. The believing status of the audience and what they are on the precipice of forfeiting, which is lack loss of blessings. And then after I th present what I think is the accurate view of the passage, I'll interact with the other views that you see out there, the reform, what I would call the reform view, 
Arminian view and what's called the hypothetical view. Now, the Reformed view, as I'll show you, has so much uh, press coverage that most people think that's the only view of the passage. This loss of blessings view, most people in your churches have probably never heard of. So let's go ahead and start off with the Exodus generation itself. And I just want to sell you on the idea that these people that came out of Egypt and went down to Sinai to receive the law, these people were in faith. They were, at least in the Old Testament sense of the word, believers. In the Old Testament sense of the word, they, they were what, we would, what I would call uh, regenerated. So why would I think that? Well, we have evidence from the Old Testament itself, and then we have evidence from the New Testament itself. And as you put these pieces together, to me the case becomes uh, very, very overwhelming that we're dealing with believers. A lot of verses I'm going to be uh, floating around to, so you might want to keep up if you could. If not, that's all right as well. But back in Exodus 4, verses 22 and 23, Israel, this is while they are still in Egypt, is called God's firstborn son. And then over in Exodus 12, verses 27 and 28, this is right after Passover, it says there that they worshipped the Lord. It says, and the people bowed down low and worshipped. Probably a key verse in the whole thing, at least as far as, far as my view of it is concerned, is Exodus 14, verses 30 and 31. Now this is right after they passed through the Red Sea and God closed the Red Sea and the Egyptians had drowned. And in Exodus 14 verse 31 it says this, and they, I got the, the underlined portion there, relevant portion underlined, they believed in the Lord. Now, the first guy to open my eyes to this idea that I'm going to give to you is Dr. Ronald Allen. I was taking him for a course at Dallas Seminary. I had him for Pentateuch in the morning, and I had Dr. Pentecost for the book of Hebrews in the afternoon. And neither gentleman knew that I was taking what class from whom. But they, as Ron Allen was moving into Exodus 14, Dwight Pentecost was moving into Hebrews 6. And it's almost like the Lord just put me at exactly the right place and time for what I would call a paradigm shift. Because this loss of blessings view is not something that I held to before. I, I frankly didn't even understand it. But this is one of the points Ron Allen makes, and you can get his treatment on it in the Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Commentary. Allen writes this, The people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, in his servant Moses. Allen observes, this is quoting a little bit from my paper, that this verse is nearly sem semantically identical to Genesis 15.6, which the New Testament uses as an example of Abraham's justification. Paul, of course, camps on this verse in Romans 4 and other places. Both verses contain the, the hyphil plus the preposition by followed by the name Yahweh. And Ron Allen says the only difference between the two verses, that's Genesis 14, uh, Genesis 15, 6 and Exodus 14, 31, the only real difference between the two verses is that the verb is singular in Genesis 15, 6, while in Exodus 14, 31 it is plural. Allen further observes that just as Paul uses the chronology of Genesis 15, 6, and Genesis 17 to prove that Abraham was justified before being circumcised, Exodus 14:31 could very well be used to prove that the nation was justified before receiving the law, which came sometime later. So if this connection between Genesis 15:6 and Exodus uh, 14 verse 31 is accurate, you have very strong evidence that those that came out of Egypt and passed through the Red Sea were in faith. And that would make sense because Exodus 15 records them worshiping the Lord. And it records them worshiping, worshiping, worshiping 
uh, as they're leaving Egypt and going down to Sinai to receive the law. In fact, Exodus 33 and verse 10 says, When all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Um, Exodus 19.8, the people have a desire to submit to the Lord. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. I mean, they didn't get very far, obviously. <laughs> but uh, at least the intent was there. Exodus 24, verse 7, we will be obedient. Now, is that can that be describing unregenerate people? Um, to me, that's difficult because Romans 8, verses 7 and 8 says that the flesh is hostile towards God. It does, submit, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Now, people say, oh, come on, these, these people weren't saved. Don't you know that they made the golden calf? I mean, how can a saved person worship a golden calf? By the way, when they worship the golden calf, they only broke the first two commandments of the ten. So that's not a good start. But notice the book of First uh, Corinthians. See, people that say a believer could never worship a golden calf, I don't know if they're really studying the book of First Corinthians. 1 Corinthians calls the folks mentioned in that book saints. It says that they're sanctified positionally. Now, you go through the book of 1 Corinthians, which Ray Steadman called First Californians, and these folks in Corinth don't look very saintly, do they? Chapters 1 through 4, they're fighting over their favorite Bible teacher, um, chapter 5, there's incest going on. Chapter 6, prostitution. Uh, chapter 6, lawsuits amongst believers. Chapter 7, all kinds of issues related to divorce and remarriage. Chapters 8 through 10, uh, you have the stronger brother flaunting his freedom in the presence of the weaker brother. Chapter 11, they're drunk and disorderly at the Lord's table. Uh, chapters 12 through 14, you have all of these abuses of spiritual gifts where tongue talkers are put on a pedestal with no interpretation. Chapter 15, they're denying resurrection. I mean, that's not very saintly activity, is it? And what's interesting is I go through th that book and 2 Corinthians. I never find their salvation ever challenged a single time. In fact, in chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, Do you not know that when you go visit the temple prostitute, you're taking the Holy Spirit with you into that uh, relationship? So obviously you look at this, their salvation isn't challenged, their justification is not challenged, but their progressive sanctification is challenged. And you see, that's my answer to this idea that you cannot, a, a true believer would never worship a golden calf. So that's the Old Testament evidence for their salvation, still speaking of that Exodus generation. Now, notice the New Testament. Look over at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 6. Does the New Testament treat the Exodus, Kadesh Barnea generation, the first generation leaving Egypt, as believers? It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 6, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. It's interesting that the church that we're part of is analogized to that generation that left Egypt. It's also interesting that Paul analogizes the Exodus generation to members of the New Testament church. In fact, in this passage, Paul even says that the water from the rock that the Exodus generation drank from typified spiritual drink offered by the spiritual rock, Jesus Christ. Looks like the New Testament is treating these people like they were actual believers. You go over into Hebrews 11, verse 29, the hall of faith, the great heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. 
And who's in there? Hebrews 11, verse 29 says, but this is the Exodus generation. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. They're in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, along with everybody else in the hall of faith, presumably a believer. And beyond that, to leave Egypt, they had to participate in Passover. They took the, and this is how their homes were protected from the 10th plague and the death God brought on the firstborn. By the way, we were talking a little bit earlier with Tommy's presentation about uh, the Abrahamic covenant still being in effect. Those who curse you, I will curse. Why did God kill the firstborn all over Egypt? The answer is Israel is God's firstborn. Exodus 4, 22 and 23. You tamper with my firstborn, I'm coming after your firstborn. That's a very literal outworking, isn't it, of Genesis 12:3. By the way, why did God drown the Egyptians in the Red Sea? Because the e Egyptians, what were they doing to the babies drowning them in the Nile? See how literal the Abrahamic covenant is? Those who curse you, I will curse. So they had put the blood of the Passover lamb you know, on their doorposts. That's why they were spared from plague 10. And to do that, that would require faith. So all of these people were in faith. Now, people say, well, wait a minute. If they were in faith, they never entered Canaan. So even a lot of our songs, you know, allude to Canaan as heaven. So they didn't enter Canaan. So I guess they weren't Christians, right? Well, if that's your view, you got to, there's a big problem. Moses didn't enter either. Moses died having seen Canaan from afar from the plains of Moab. Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 through 8. Moses never entered Canaan. Now, are we going to say Moses was an unbeliever? Moses didn't go to heaven? That doesn't make any sense because Moses is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ. Matthew 17, verse 3. Moses is in the Hall of Faith. Hebrews 11 verses 23 through 28. And Moses could very well be one of the two witnesses. Revelation 11, verse 6. See, if you say that all these people that didn't enter Canaan all went to hell, then God sent 2.5 million people to hell. It's basically the argument that's made. Now, Joshua and Caleb did enter with the kids as seasoned citizens 40 years later in their 80s. Uh, with all of the 40-year-olds. Um, but why did they enter? Not because they were believers, but because they were believing. And see, there's a big difference there. When you look at the passages surrounding Joshua and Caleb, for example, uh, back in Numbers 23, 12, it says, except the son of, and a couple of names I'm not going to try to pronounce here, Kenizzite and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they followed the Lord fully. So it's not saying that uh, Joshua and Caleb were believers, the rest of them weren't. What it's saying is Joshua and Caleb were different because as saved believers, they continued to trust the Lord. So everybody else was left out of Canaan, not for being an unbeliever, but for being unbelieving, see. So you put together this Old Testament evidence and you put together this New Testament evidence and you've got, I believe, a, be a believing audience that came out of Egypt and passed through the Red Sea. So what happened to them? Well, they got right to the edge of Canaan at a place called Kadesh Barnea. They looked into the land. They stopped trusting the Lord, even though these people are saved. Has that ever happened in your life, by the way? Do you as a saved person ever stop trusting the Lord in an emergency? No. And so that's why they were disciplined. So Numbers 
14, verses 22 and 23, says this, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. What did they lose? Not heaven. They lost a blessing they could have had above and beyond heaven, flowing from their justification, a blessing they could have had right then and that now, in addition to heaven, which was Canaan. And the thing to understand about all of this is the decision that they made became at that point irrevocable. It could not be withdrawn. Because the next day, after the Lord told you none of you are, are going to enter, they all got brave all of a sudden, remember? Numbers 14, verses 40 through 45, and they said, you know, that to heck with what the Lord said. We're going to enter anyway. And we know how that story ended. They were beaten back by the giants, the Bible says, as far as, as, far as Hormah. So that then becomes the lens or the paradigm through which to understand the book of Hebrews, which is why the writer is directing us back to that story by quoting Psalm 95 in Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11. So let's move from there to the Hebrews themselves in the New Testament. And I just want to make the same two points. Number one, the Hebrews, like the Kadesh Barnea generation, was in faith. And number two, they were on the precipice of forfeiting a blessing. So is it really true that the people in the book of Hebrews, not most of them, but all of them, are regen were regenerated when the writer wrote this book? I think that is correct. And that's the probably the most important issue to come get, a, get settled in your mind if you're going to take a position on Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. So let me try to establish, if I could, the believing, regenerated status of the Hebrews. We want to look at the extended context, preceding context, immediate context, and subsequent context. You go through this whole book, and it's somewhat overwhelming that you're dealing with saved people in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1 verse 2 uses the word us. Was the writer saved? Of course. So he's identifying with the spiritual status of the audience. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says the audience has been purged from their sins. Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 3 says they've neglected their salvation. Now you can't neglect your salvation unless you have what? Salvation. It's like someone saying you're neglecting your wife. We have to have a wife to neglect. And no comments there on the third row. <laughs> Hebrews 3.1 calls them holy brethren. Hebrews 4.1 says they need not salvation but rest. Hebrews 4.3 says fellow believers together with me, the writer, Hebrews 4.14 says they have access to Jesus Christ as their high priest. Hebrews 4.16 indicates they have access to the throne room of grace. Hebrews 10 verses 36 through 39 never tells them they need to get saved. It tells them they need endurance. Hebrews 10:22 through 25 says they've been sprinkled from an unclean conscience. Hebrews 9:14 says they've been serving the living God. Hebrews 10:10 10, 10 calls them sanctified. Hebrews 10.15 says they have the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12.12 12 says Jesus is the author and finisher of their faith. Hebrews 12.7 calls them sons. If a son, then a what? An heir. Hebrews 12.28 says that they're inheriting a kingdom. I mean, they, it reads like they're regenerated people, doesn't it? In fact, in the book of Hebrews, there are 38 exhortations for the audience to follow, and never once are they told to believe the gospel and be saved. Very different than John's gospel, who, which I think is primarily an evangelistic gospel, where he's writing to unbelievers. To, and we know that because he tells them to believe in Jesus and receive the gift of life meaning they don't have it yet. You have nothing like that in the book of Hebrews. 
And then let's take a look at the immediately preceding context. Go over, if you could, to Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. See, we're gradually inching our way to Hebrews 6. But we need to look at the whole context. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 is one area of the preceding context to be followed by Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Notice what Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 says. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. They look like they're saved people, doesn't it? First of all, they need to grow, mature. Not get saved, but to mature. Beyond that, they are called infants. Paul uses that expression, infants in Christ, meaning they've begun in the Lord. What is the dead giveaway for me is this, for though by this time some of you ought to be teachers... Would you ever want an unbeliever to teach a believer? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? He says you need milk and not solid food. Kind of reminds us of 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Uh, he criticizes them because they are slow to learn. Now, is an unbeliever really slow to learn? No, unbelievers, Romans 3.11, don't seek God. They have to be convicted by the Spirit of God. Um, he says in here that they need to be able to distinguish better, to discern good from evil. I don't think an unbeliever whose mind is blinded by the God of this age even has that ability at all, unless they're reacting to conscience or the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. So you put all this together, and Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14, looks a lot like these folks are saved. Moving our way gradually now into Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, but before that, a quick stop at Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, more of the preceding context. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instructions about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Notice the therefore connecting this block of material to wit what preceded it. Y'all know the Holy Spirit didn't put the chapter divisions in the Bible? Some guy named Stephen Langton, I think, put those in, what, 1600s, based on a long, bumpy carriage ride. And I think the road got bumpy at a certain point, because a lot of times his chapter breaks make a lot of sense. Other times it disrupts the flow of the passage. But this block of material is dialing back to what we just covered in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. He goes on and he says you need to press on to maturity, not to believe, but to press on to maturity. Now notice the us and the we in there. Let us. We will do. So the author is identifying with the spiritual status of his audience when he makes those statements. He says you need to get beyond the basics, which are what? Faith toward God. So that seems to indicate that they already had faith towards God and were already saved. And you need to leave the elementary teachings about Christ, not laying again a foundation of, and he lists a bunch of things. So this gives you the idea that they were, had already been exposed to the basics. So the extended context and the preceding context seems to argue that we're dealing with regenerated people. All right, let's move on now to our problem passage, the immediate context, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, which we have already read. Notice the word for at the beginning of verse 4, connecting that material to what precedes it. So whatever you're concluding about the preceding material is going to have some kind of impact on how you view Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. And what you'll discover is there are five 
descriptive phrases. Now, this is a uh, PowerPoint from Ray Mondragon, and he's looking at me saying, how did you get that? Uh, I have a church member taking his class at Chafer, and so I wanted to make sure Ray was still orthodox, and so I looked through his PowerPoint, and I saw this, and I said, that's a great chart there, Be and so I stole it, plagiarized it, so I'll be confessing my sins later. But <laughs> what that teaches is basic um, hermeneutical procedure. And the reason I put this up here is this, I believe, is where most people go wrong in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Notice what you do when you interpret words. You start with the word itself, and then you proceed out from there to the immediate context. Then you proceed out from there to the same book. How does the writer use the same term in the same book? What I'm finding is people that are misinterpreting this are skipping that step. Uh, they're going into every passage in the Bible. For example, the MacArthur Study Bible. Um, I like a lot of the things John MacArthur says, but when you l look at Hebrews 6, 4, th 4 through 6, he literally sends you into every passage in the Bible that's remotely similar and he doesn't interact with how the same writer in the same book uses the same term. You, you follow that? So that, I believe, is the key towards properly interpreting Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. So there are five clauses in <coughs> Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, that convince me that we're dealing with believers here. One of them, it says, who have once been enlightened. And if you go over to Hebrews 10, verse 32, by the way, it's the Greek word uh, photos, uh, photos thintos, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's the identical word enlightened in Hebrews 10:32. It says, but we remember the former days when after being enlightened. Now you look at the context of Hebrews 10, and it's obvious you're dealing with regenerated people because it says down in verse 34, they have better possessions and lasting possessions, and it says they're going to receive a reward. Verse 34, uh, followed by verse 35. Not only that, but in this expression, enlightened, it says who have once been enlightened. That is the Greek word hapox. That is a word that is used over and over and over again in this book to describe something that happens one time. So quoting a little bit from my paper here, uh, those enlightened in Hebrews 10.32 proved their justification. Actually, that's not what I was looking for. Um, one time you'll find in Hebrews 9.7, Uh, it talks about the priest who enters once a year. Hop, that's hopox. Hebrews 9, 26 and 28. Uh, but now once at the end of the ages, hopox. It is appointed for man to die once and then to face the judgment, hopox. So Christ has been offered once, hopox. See, the way the author uses this word once indicates a one-time event that happened in their lives. So he used the word enlightened to describe saved people, and to me what seals the deal is that word hopox. It's not talking about people that experimented or sampled the Spirit. It's talking about something that one time has already happened to them. Jude verse 3 talks about truth once and for all been delivered to the saints. That's the word hopox as well. Another phrase is these folks in the book of Hebrews have tasted of the heavenly gift. And people like to say, well, taste means just a kind of a sampling. But remember our rule. How does the writer use the same expression? I think the Greek word here is geomai, the verb. And you probably know Hebrews 2.9, same writer, same book where Jesus tasted, that's the same word, death for every man. Jesus did not experiment with or sample death. He went into a full experience of death. So by using the same expression, the writer is saying these folks have had a full 
not just a conviction, but a full experience with the Holy Spirit. Now, you'll also notice this word gift. Uh, it's the Greek word doria. And quoting a little bit from my paper, in all of its other ten usages in the New Testament, it either refers to a regenerated person receiving a gift from God, or to the gift of regeneration itself. And when you track that through the New Testament, you'll see that Doria is used that way. Now there I'm going outside of Hebrews, because I don't think the author of Hebrews uses that particular word. So this is talking about a complete salvation experience or regeneration. A third clause that you'll find in here is that the audience has been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for partaker is metakoi, which means partnership. Hebrews 1.9, Hebrews 3.1, Hebrews 3.14, uh, Hebrews 12.8. It is often used to describe partnership. For example, it is used of companions of the Messianic King, Hebrews 1.9. It is also used of partners in a heavenly calling, Hebrews 3.1 and 14. It is also used of partners in discipline. Thus, Hebrews 6 must also be speaking of a full partnership of the Spirit rather than just an initial taste of Him. And it's also used of regenerated people throughout the book of Hebrews and all of its uses the references are regenerate people Hebrews 1 9 speaks of regenerated partners of the king Hebrews 3 1 speaks of regenerated holy brethren as partners of the heavenly calling when Hebrews 12 8 mentions those who partake in discipline Hebrews 12 6 reminds us that only God's children go through divine discipline so that expression partakers of the Holy Spirit not going into the rest of the Bible but the way the author uses the, the expression seems to be if we consistently interpret it speaking of a regenerated person uh, and a fourth expression here it says they have tasted of the Word of God there's tasted again is based on Hebrews 2 9 a full experience with the Word of God not just a sampling. Tasted of the Word of God, going outside the context a little bit here, reminds us of 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. You know, like newborn babes, we should crave pure spiritual milk now that you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Psalm 34, 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So taste is not a sampling, but it is a full experience with uh, with God. And then uh, the last little expression here, just in the immediate context, is they have tasted of the powers of the age to come. Again, taste is a full experience. And of the powers of the age to come, what I think that means is they have tasted of the tokens of the kingdom. Jesus came in the first century offering the kingdom. And his miracles largely were saying to Israel, if you enthrone me on my terms, then all of these miracles that you see happening will bless the entire world. And we know the tragic story how Israel rejected the offer of the kingdom. But in the tokens of the kingdom, people could taste of the powers of the age to come. Um, and again, that's a full experience, the way this word taste is used. So if I was stuck on a desert island, I didn't know anything about theological disputes, I would look at this and say these people are regenerated. These people are saved. In fact, here's one interpreter who doesn't think they're saved, writes this. The most immediate impulse would be to interpret this cluster of statements as describing regenerate persons. Well, great. Stop the sentence there. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say there's, there's no way these people are saved. Because there's three things in verse 6 that bother people. People say, well, look at the word repentance. Repentance is what an unbeliever does, not a believer. Wasn't David a believer when he sinned? Did he not repent as a believer? So that argument doesn't hold too well. Now, the one that really gets people is this one. 
Verse 6, since they again crucify the Son of God and put him to open shame. And people say there's no way a true Christian could re-crucify the Son of God and put him to open shame. But see, you have to put yourself in the position of the audience. They are being persecuted by unbelieving Jews. They are thinking, just to get these unbelieving Jews off their back, of retrogressing and going back into Judaism just to avoid persecution. And should the audience do that, the New Testament is telling them that they are publicly identifying with the nation that crucified Christ. In other words, if you are to drift back into Judaism and renounce your confession just to avoid persecution, just to get these unbelieving Jews off your back who are persecuting you, then you are publicly identifying with the nation that crucified Jesus. You're saying Israel, first century Israel had it right, publicly. The church that I have been aligned with through my baptism, first my faith, then my baptism, had it wrong. So that's how I think it's possible for a regenerated person to again cruci- re-crucify the Son of God. We have an ability, do we not, as New Testament Christians, to grieve the Spirit? Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Spirit of God. I must have an ability to do that as a saved person, or Ephesians 4.30 wouldn't make any sense. And then another expression that people use to say these can't be speaking of regenerated people is this expression, and they have fallen away. And people say it's impossible for a believer to fall away. Therefore, this warning must be written to unbelievers within the crowd. Because a true believer could never fall away from God. May I just say to you, a believer can fall away from God. Peter did, did he not? By denying the Lord three times. David did. And we could go through many, many people in the Bible that did this this very thing. So fall away from what? The context back to Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 is press on to maturity. You're going to fall away from your opportunity to grow in Christ when you depart from New Testament revelation and go back to the temple system. So you look at the evidence, and I think the immediate context indicates that we're dealing with saved people. Now, what about the subsequent context, the verses that immediately follow Hebrews 6, 4 through 6? It says, For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God, but it yields thorns and thistles. It is worthless and close to being uh, cursed, it ends up being burned. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I think there's a lot of evidence that you're dealing with saved people. First of all, notice four, which connects this block of material to what we just went over. So if the prior block of material is saved people, then these people here must be saved as well. Notice the expression drink. You go through the book of John, drink, pino. Now I got to go to John a little bit because I'm not sure Hebrews uses the word drink, but in John it's talking about people that receive Christ, the woman at the well, for example, and other verses. You'll notice this expression, vegetation and blessings. Thorns and thistles and cursed. Now who is this written to? The Hebrews. Did not Jewish people understand the blessings and curses of the Mosaic Law? Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. See, that's what that imagery would remind them of. 
And keep in mind that the Mosaic law was not given to redeem a people, right? But it was given to a people already redeemed. So that imagery itself, if you study out the chronology of when the Mosaic law was given, actually argues for a saved person, I, I believe. Um, then you go on and you see this little expression here, beloved. Now, this word beloved is used um, about 60 times in the New Testament. And in nine occasions, it refers to the Father's love for Christ. But in the remaining 51 occasions, it refers clearly to believers. So that expression, beloved, to me, uh, easily communicates you're dealing with a saved audience. And then look what these people are doing. He's reminding them of their work and the love which you have shown towards his name and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints, diligence, that seems to be describing saved people as well. Now people look at some expressions here though and they say, wait a minute, are you telling me that thorns and thistles can apply to a believer? The NIV really does a huge disservice here because it gives you the impression that there's two lands spoken of. But when you actually study it in Greek, verse 7, it never has two lands. It's one land bearing both thorns and thistles. To me, that thorns and thistles perfectly describes the audience. There's vegetation and thorns and thistles. Why is that? Because there's negative things about them, they need to press on to maturity. They're thinking of lapsing backward. But there's positive things about them as well. Look at all of the charitable works and things they are doing. So thorns and thistles alongside vegetation in and of itself does not disqualify these people from being believers. Now people say, well, look, they're called worthless. I mean, can a, can a believer be called worthless? Yes. A dakamas, the word translated worthless, Paul applies to himself in terms of potentially being disqualified for a prize. Uh, worthless doesn't mean rejected. It means to be disapproved. And then the one that really gets people is this word curse. Are you telling me that a believer can be cursed? Who are we, who are we talking to? Hebrew Christians who understood the Mosaic law which was given following their redemption from Egypt and were there not curses for disobedience built into the Mosaic law, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. If you want to see the curse that's coming on these people, you, you just read Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, whom the Lord loves, the Lord what? Disciplines. So curse in and of itself does not disqualify someone uh, from being a believer. Now here's the one that really bothers people. Burned. That's hell. And um, I would say most of the time in the Bible when you see flames and burning, it, t it typically describes hell. But that's not true all the time. For example, in the paper I quote Elder Pliny who wrote in A.D. 112, that the same general Greco-Roman time period, and he says the reason you set a field on fire in the ancient world was not to destroy the field, but to do what? Make the field more productive. I mean, can you even burn ground? No, you, you burn it so that you can bring forth a greater crop on it. So burning itself could be, speaking of a believer, it could be speaking of divine discipline, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, in the context of reward, says, If any man's work is what? Burned up. He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, as though through fire. So there's an example where burning refers to believers. And the trials that we face are, are called God sending us, 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, through the refiner's what? Fire. That's fire aimed at a believer, not an unbeliever. So all references to burning and fire does not automatically 
uh, communicate hell, although I would say most do. I, I gave you in the paper a couple of passages, Isaiah 9, verses 18 and 19, Isaiah 10, 17, where God's anger burned not against unbelievers, but against his own people. So burn, burning anger, can be applicable in some context to believers. And I think that's the way the expression is being used here in Hebrews uh, 6. So the Hebrews were believing. That's what I'm trying to get at. So what is going on? Both the Exodus generation and the Hebrews are regenerated. But there's more similarities. Both of them are on the precipice of forfeiting something. Hebrews 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 3, the Hebrews in the New Testament were on the precipice of forfeiting maturity. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, Robbie gave me the high sign, but... He told me five, but I may choose to interpret that a little allegorically. So, <laughs> But I will do my best. I'm just getting to the altar call, for crying out loud. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Hebrews, um, Hebrews 5, what are they forfeiting? They're forfeiting maturity because they're being pressed to go back to the law. Can the law bring you to maturity? No, it can't. Every moment you spend under the law, if you retrogress, you're going to forfeit on a blessing which you could have had. So the Kadesh Barnea generation forfeited Canaan. These folks are going to forfeit maturity. And what do we do with this verse 6? This word impossible. It's going to be impossible to renew you again to repentance. Impossible does not mean difficult. When you track this word impossible through the book of Hebrews, um, adunatos, elsewhere the author uses adunatos to convey that it is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6.18. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, Hebrews 10.4. It is impossible to please God without faith, Hebrews 11.6. So if they retrogress, it's going to be impossible to get them out of their condition. Impossible for who? Not God. Because is there anything possible for God? No. Genesis eighteen fourteen verse uh, says that. So what I think is happening is these people are meeting in small groups. Hebrews three thirteen says, but encourage one another. Hebrews ten twenty five says, forsake not the what assembling of yourselves together. In other words, if you retrogress, it's going to be impossible for your small group to lift you out of the immaturity you're going to be in. You're going to permanently forfeit maturity. God can lift you out of it, but the small group that you're meeting in will not be able to lift you out of it. That's how I'm interpreting impossible. But then in verse 9, he says, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Uh, there was still hope. These people had not crossed the point of no return as the Exodus generation had done, although they were rapidly approaching the line. And so the warning is to warn them about this before it's too late. And he uses Kadesh Barnea as an example of what can happen, how a believer can forfeit a blessing. In this case, these people are going to forfeit maturity just as the Kadesh Barnea generation forfeited Canaan. So real quick, that's, that's my view, loss of rewards view. Reform view, what does that say? Well, the warnings are addressed, Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, is addressed to unbelievers within the flock. People that are externally affiliated with Christ, but are never actual possessors, but only professors like Judas. John MacArthur holds this view. He says, does Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 teach that a true believer can never lose his salvation? No. In that passage, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to the unsaved 
who have heard the truth and acknowledged it, but who have hesitated to embrace Christ. See, the reform view is this basically this idea that this passage is aimed at the unbelievers in the crowd. Now think about this from a pastoral angle for a minute. If you stand up in front of your flock and you get to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, and you say, this only applies to unbelievers, what are your people going to do? Mentally check out. It doesn't apply to me. I'm a believer. But if you start applying this to believers, that there's something even a believer can forfeit, then they're going to be listening. So the reform view doesn't interact with the believing status of the Exodus generation, the believing status of Hebrews 6, the word enlightened, how the author uses it, the word hopox, once enlightened, the word taste is not interacted with well as a full experience. And uh, one particular individual says this, uh, I don't know if such a view could have ever come into existence without the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Barnes says, it seems plain to me that no other interpretation would ever been thought of if this view had not seemed to conflict with the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. So it seems to be a theological presupposition read backwards into the text. Real quickly, the Arminian view, I'm actually closer to the Arminian view than the Reform view on this, because the Arminian view is acknowledging, well, these people are saved. But they what? They lost their salvation. The Reformed view is saying these people aren't saved at all. The Arminian view says they are saved, but they are on the precipice of losing their salvation. Um, the problem with this is when the Kadesh Barnea generation did not enter Canaan, did God cut them off from provision? Did God cut Israel off permanently? No, he continued to provide through them with manna. He gave them messianic prophecies, as in Numbers 24, verse 17. And there's a lot of other passages that very clearly teach we can never lose our salvation. Not the least of which is John 10, verses 27 through 29. The last view that people like to argue, this is the Charles Ryrie view, who I speak respectfully of because he passed away just recently. But basically, if you look at the Ryrie Study Bible, he's basically arguing that this is a hypothetical. Uh, I call it the, the Disney World view. <laughs> and we just got back from Disney World. So you take your kids all the way across country to Disney World, and they start acting up. And you say to them, if you don't straighten out right now, we're going to just get in the car and go home. And in the back of your mind, you know based on all the money you've paid <laughs> to get out there, that you're not going home. It's just kind of an idle threat. And if you read this, the Ryrie Study Bible, he writes this, Others understand this passage to be a warning to genuine believers to urge them on in Christian growth and maturity. To fall away is impossible, parenthesis, since according to this view, true believers are eternally secure. But the phrase is placed in the sentence to strengthen the warning it is similar to saying something like this to a class of students. It is impossible for a student once enrolled in this course, if he turns the clock back, parenthesis, which cannot be done, close parenthesis, to start the course over. Therefore, let all students go on to a deeper knowledge. In this view, the phrase in verses 4 and 5 are understood to refer to the conversion experience. So you see what he's arguing here is this is an idle threat of some kind. The problems I have with it are, number one, it makes God deceptive. When God warns about something that can never happen, that seems to, be, to me to be a deception. And number two, going back to Kadesh Barnea. That was really something that happened to them, wasn't it? That wasn't an idle threat. That whole generation, 2.5 million of them, including Moses, wandered, all except for Joshua and Caleb, wandered around in the wilderness until they all died. That is a historical happenstance that actually transpired, so I don't think the uh, hypothetical view really works. I don't think the Arminian view works, largely because of Kadesh Barnea. I don't think the 
so-called reform view works because of, because of Kadesh Barnea. I think the view that really works in the whole thing is a loss of blessings view. And it's just a matter of understanding the Exodus generation and their believing status and what they lost. The Hebrews had a believing status as well, but they were on the precipice of not hell, but forfeiting a blessing. And the other views really don't connect the dots well with Numbers 13 and 14. All right, I'm done talking.